on you if you need to me to unmute I will just wave and I'll unmute Okay. All right, it looks like we're recording. Okay. Uh, today is June 9th, 2021. It is 12:15 uh, p.m. and uh, I call the, this meeting of the Citizens Environmental Advisory Committee to order. Uh, we start with a roll call of all members. Okay, Mr. Jones, I'm here. Uh, Mr. Vegas will be out. Uh, Mr. Gonzalez, I'm present. Mr. Jordan, here. Ms. Rubio, here. Uh, Bianca should be on her way. Ms. Otero? Here. And Ms. Gonzalez? Here. Did you get uh, welcome? Did you get uh, sworn in? No, not yet. No, not yet. Okay. And so, um, Ms. Gonzalez is the new appointee for District 8. We don't always get barbecues. This is a special day for you. Thank you. Uh, moving on to the third item on the, uh, on the agenda, um, the, the approval of the minutes. I know that uh, Ms. Matthews has circulated a copy of last month's minutes. I don't know Does anybody need a copy? Read them, or if anyone had any objections to the minutes that were posted. She just doesn't make discussion at some point soon on uh, a separate issue involving ethylene oxide with the plant Midwest sterilization um, and its impacts uh, within the community as far as what's happening with cancer risks and air quality but I know that's separate from today's agenda item okay have you discussed it, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the possibility of putting this on the agenda of the trial yeah the first part yes okay um, Item five is discussion of possible action on recommended changes to the hazardous materials ordinance, uh, which I guess is continued from our from our last meeting, right? Yes. Yes. So um, correct me if I'm wrong. We kind of ended up last meeting talking about um, looking at different uh, buffer zones from 200 feet up to up to 500 feet, and, and Mr. Adrian Goss uh, put together this map. And so he, he was able to show, he put a number of schools on here. I'm trying to zoom in. And so the, I guess the orange, Adrian, is the 200? The inner 200 and 300 and 400 and 300, 500. 400 500. Mm -hmm. And so just looking at, sorry, other schools in there too. Looking at Muller, you can see uh, th there clearly would be um, a few warehouses that, that are affected. Um, oh, there we go. We've got a very slow internet here. And let me 
see if I can zoom out to some of the other schools, but I, I think this this area would would be uh, affected most. And we also have. You can see if we were to to expand it, with just the sheer number of warehouses in the Lansford area that have has a permit. Uh, here's United High School. And so it looks like maybe maybe one if we're going from property line to property line. It looks like maybe one warehouse would be affected. Go down to three fifty nine. school uh, that's near the landfill. It doesn't look like there would be any warehouses uh, that have hazmat permits in that area. Uh, although around the SAC, and I think that's quite our, it looks like there may be some that would be affected there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, this one's kind of peculiar right here because that's an actual LISD facility and you have a HESMAC permit. So I don't, I don't know if, uh, obviously if, if they didn't move that, it wouldn't be affected if the grandfathered in because there's, uh, what's the, uh, what's the school next to that one? I think it's a case uh, Tarver. Tarver, that's right, Tarver. Yeah, there's Tarver that's close to that. Um, Typically, these sites, you know, maybe different owners. Um, they'll be they'll be they'll be the same address. So a company will come in and they'll go ahead and take over the operation. So these things change. This is a few months old now. This database. So yeah, uh, yeah. I can publish a, a refresh. And, and depending on how 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 much of a turnover there is, if if this passes, then obviously, um, if a new owner comes in, then they would not be able to acquire a. A permit if if a buffer zone is if they're within that buffer zone. I think, I think this area probably would be the one with the, the most affected uh, warehouses, and and it's also obviously closest to the warehouses. What are other cities doing as far as establishing these buffer zones for people? They're really not. They're really not there. I think Austin, um, <laughs> I mean, what I've seen is like 50 foot, uh, 100 foot. I, I, yeah, I, there's not any city that I could find that had, um, I think, more than 100, maybe 200 feet. But right. So there's no model ordinance either? No, no. And, and in fact, the hazmat ordinance that was created. Um, well, the SEAC was created to work on the hazmat ordinance back in 98, and um, we had gotten a, a grant where some, I think St. Mary's Law students uh, helped craft uh, the ordinance, and um, we, we didn't have a model to look at. We you know, basically were trailblazers with, with this type of ordinance. So. And ours has been in place since 98? Ours has been in place since 98, yes. And currently, our, our ordinance does not speak to this issue at all? It does not. No, it basically says as long as you're in the M1 or M2, then, then you, can, you can obtain a, a hazmat permit. So how many, how many schools do you think would be affected? Uh, looks like right now, uh, warehouses or around schools would be. It, it looks like uh, Muller and potentially uh, United High School. Four or five warehouses between them. Yeah, and if you chose 500, it looks like maybe four here and one over by uh, United. This is not too hard. Right? No. And I'm assuming these uh, these warehouses that have these hazmat licenses, they've been licensed to do this for years and years. Mm -hmm. Again, as Adrian uh, mentioned, that 
in some areas we, we have had turnover where a company goes out of business and somebody moves in, right. gets in, a new permit. I wonder how many of these warehouses are rental. Right I, I would say a lot of them are. Yeah. You know, like the Costco's and the the, the big named warehouses obviously aren't, but mm -hmm. the smaller uh, warehouses uh, I think are, are renting. They don't own. And based upon uh, the studies that you made, what, what what's a reasonable number of feet that we could request as far as the setback? Again, I think, uh, I mean, I think 200 to, to 500 to me seems reasonable. It just depends on what the committee thinks uh, it should be. Does anyone have any thoughts on that? Adam, I was expecting you to have some thoughts on that because you've had a lot of thoughts on this subject so yes, far. Yes, but I'd like for someone else to speak to and then I'll... Uh, I remember Ms. Uh, associate Attorney or Assistant uh, City, City Attorney mm -hmm. shared uh, some information last at the last meeting about the other cities, and you know you also mentioned some other situations about land taking. Um, you know, I guess I go back, and I know our job is not to look at residential. I understand that, but many, like for example, Muller is there, and. Um, thinking they're building a school off of Riverbank, if I'm not mistaken, close to the uh, it's a, a, can a you quero. A quero. Mm -hmm. a quero. Yeah, that's over. Because that's what Chewy Reese was speaking to me about the other uh, month, last month. Is it's mostly residential, isn't it? There. Yeah. The quero, yeah. North of Columbia. It's just north of the bridge. Right. <clears throat> when you get when you get boring, it'd be south of there. So I was curious. If, do you have that also, in a way, looked at as far as warehousing? Right. Is it right there, John? Yeah. Is that it? The only one? Yeah. This would this would be. So there's uh, nothing. Or move your mouse up above that right. dirt road. There's a quero. Yeah. Which on? Right there. there. Up? No. Go up. Right there. Right there. Right. That lot. That corner. So north of that. That's what they're planning to put into school. Okay. Trade. Which bridge? That. that right trade. there. That's the location. So being here. Yes. It doesn't look like. It doesn't look like there's any. They're just starting. They're just starting to bring. Send us information and request our hybrid tests and things like that. So Mr. Gauss. Gauss, right? Gauss. 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 Okay. Gauss. 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 My question is for the purpose of this recommendation that we're considering making to City Council. Since that looks so nice and clean and undeveloped, and Mr. Reese said his, he's been involved in the development of the land and, and he will build some affordable housing there as well as Armadillo and some other companies, I'm sure. I was wondering if we couldn't protect it, you know, as we make this suggestion for future and, and existing, those that are currently being built, could we have that leeway to say 2,000, you know, a, a half a mile? I would recommend that we be the jump starters in a great ordinance to protect our residents, our teachers, our students, and those of us who really care about uh, the dangers of hazardous materials being here. So that's my proposal um, for the existing schools. You know, I'm, I live in La Boca and uh, I mentioned this last meeting because Green Ranch, Wolf Creek, La Boca Ranch are subdivisions that only have one entrance and one exit. I, I am concerned. I'm concerned should there be an incident that requires evacuation. It's happened before, as close as kill them. I can recall coming home from work and there was a message on the answering machine, you must evacuate. There was a chemical spill on kill them. And so I remember going into a little bit of a panic mode, but you know, thankfully it was resolved. So to, to I guess come to a consensus on my part, I would like for us to be looking at something proactive rather than reactive 10 years down the road. Um, I hear you, Mr. Porter, John. I, I know what you're saying. That 
you know, we have to be realistic and practical, but I guess I'm idealistic and hopeful. And I would hope others share my concern that, you know, we need to, to look at things, not just for today, but I love that. I love seeing something pure and clean right now. And um, is this the part where I want to share? I have a couple of comments. Sure, that, sure. Okay, I'd like to share that I, I wasn't able to get uh, this gentleman to speak today, but he did share, and he's a former UISD board member for probably 20 years, and he, his quote is this, it is a good idea to involve the school district in this decision. Yes, land is donated to UISD, but the school district could provide a qualifier regarding the distance requirement from hazardous materials near future school sightings as part of the terms with landowners who donate. So it's one thing to accept land from someone, but the you know, we could ask the school district to get involved in, in also maybe our wording could contain that so that if land is donated to a school district, the school district could have more say so about avoiding the M1 changes that can occur near an existing school site. Uh, this morning I spoke to a uh, middle school principal and she looked at me and she said, place the highest distance requirement allowed as far away as possible and uh, you know, so I haven't been out in all parts of Laredo, but I don't think there would be anything but a positive reaction from us to support a large distance requirement from you know, hazardous materials. Amen. I did it. <laughs> Trish, is there anything, what else could you add as an environmental from an environmental perspective as well? Um, I think you raised all of the good points, Joanne, and uh, I think a lot depends on what is the type of hazardous materials that are being stored around areas where the district may consider building a new campus or where the city may start approving new plats for residential areas. I think those are important things to consider, as you mentioned, for the future so that we're not dealing years down the road with um, an emergency situation that could have been less impactful um, for a school campus or a neighborhood. Um, I, I think you you raised everything very, uh, very neatly, Joanne. Just need a second, no. <laughs> I have a question. Do they, do they differentiate um, hazardous materials by categories like liquid versus aerosol? No. No. And, and that's why I, I, in trying to say like, well, this is okay, but this one isn't, it's very difficult to, but there's literally, you know, millions, tens of millions of substances out there to be able to say yes on this, but no on that, and so. Um, Are there different categories of hazmat permits? No. Just. So that, that means they could be storing like chlorine. Sure. I mean, you know, aerosol just versus fast versus paint thinner. Yeah. Yeah. That both out of the environment, but less so for. Um, John, yeah. what about um, uh, hazardous materials that are flammable? Are they are they ranked by flammability? So you know, yeah, there's there's between one and, and four uh, on on the placards. Uh, I mean, yeah, you could you could say that certain things are are you know more hazardous than than other. Do, do you just, I mean, I think it's pretty, like, uh, you follow just the TCQ, like, um, as far as, like, there's... It's, it's DOT. It's DOT, DOT. Because I remember when, um, well, back when I was TCQ, the, 
I mean, we were very limited on, on going out there just to see what, uh, what was out there, but um, we would get some calls from people like, hey, there's this. So they still would kind of, well, would still kind of get involved at a certain kind of, mm -hmm. you know, point. Mm -hmm. um, but because of lack of personnel, mm -hmm. it was just sure. too many warehouses or just too many to investigate. But maybe it's something that. So, you know, like uh, by molar, I know one's got like poly polystyrene or polyethylene beads or something like that. And so you can probably eat those things. But if there's a fire, then they're given off toxic fumes. And so, again, how do you say, okay, well, they can store it there. But then if there's a fire and it's releasing toxic fumes, it was blown into the school, well, then it is an issue. So uh, that's why I, I really want to avoid coming up with some matrix to be able to say yes on this, no on that, yes on this, no on that, and, and just come up with a blanket buffer zone around warehouses. Uh, and, 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 and to answer your question, there, there is a mechanism called zoning. Uh, and the whole idea behind zoning is to keep residential away from, from industrial. Um, I know on Lines Road, Historically, the city has not been good at that, but that is already a tool that the city has to determine where schools should be located and residents should be located. And, and uh, I think the city's improved uh, a, a lot on that. Like in, in this subdivision you're talking about, this is unplatted. It's agriculture now, but I think it's going to be all platted either residential, multifamily, or maybe uh, some, you know, B1, B2s. Again, this is a, a sin, a sin, sin of our father, right? Mm -hmm. Of our fathers right here with this M1 um, area in here. But I think in terms of this subdivision, you know, I don't see that this being zoned M, M1 or M2. And I know councils made uh, a policy that they try and keep all of the new M1s and M2s at least away from the river and, and preferably uh, to the west, or excuse me, to the east of, of Mines Road. Again, that, that's not always the case, but you know, that certainly is a tool that can help out with siting a school and, and you know, keep it close to the neighborhoods and keep it away from industrial areas. Just a question on that map, because I just need clarification. The AG stands for agriculture. Mm -hmm. So right now it's all agricultural. Mm -hmm. And can you tell me where uh, Caddo is in relation to that so that I can see how... So there, there's this pond right there. Uh -huh. And I think that... I've seen that pond. I've walked over there. Mm -hmm. just like that. Is that the same one? That, that yeah, those pretty, are pretty yeah. darn big. But well, the one in the north is one that breached back when we had that's some heavy rainfall a number of years ago, but they rebuilt the dam, which is kind of crazy. So go south of there and go to the bridge. Yeah. Okay, it was right. right. Um, see that purple? Not the purple, purple, but the lighter the, purple. This is the bridge. That's right the bridge, right? A okay, kettle's right there oh. to your left. In the middle? Oh. There between the gold? No. That's a kettle right there, the green area, oh, well, part of the green area, and then that purple area right there. Yeah, in here. It's going to be huge. So it's not a common occurrence that they build warehouse space right next to residential. This is kind of a unique thing that we're seeing. I, I think, I think at least in the Mines Road area, it's a unique thing. You, you, you see in other parts of the city, I think that there's been a better job of, of zoning and planning. Well, and of course. West Laredo, uh, you know those warehouses. Well, they have been here. They've been for, for, for forever years, in the neighborhood and there forever. But I, I, I think, yeah. We'll, as far as new constructions, we shouldn't be seeing this type of thing coming up over and over. Right, right, right. And you know, and the comprehensive plan, obviously, it, the whole idea is to, to have a more logically planned city, you know, more walkable, uh, more accessible, and, and yeah, obviously, to get away from having this this bizarre yeah. thing that we've seen. Industrial centers in the yeah. middle of the neighborhood. I have a question for Mr. Goss. <laughs> Got it, right? Um, how many warehouses 
currently would be impacted if we did a distance of between 800 and 1,000. I'm just curious, are we looking at doubling the numbers or even quadrupling? Can you? Well, let's let's look at this. It's going to require, a, I, th that's why I'm here to get Joe's direction, guidance, and questions okay. and all. I can make queries, spatial queries, that are funny, but um, I can go ahead and do an analysis you know, for that kind of thing to see, you know, that kind of impact and all that. So if you if you doubled that, yeah, you're looking at pretty much yeah. that area. I like the look of that, but I need to. <laughs> <laughs> I know that's. And then obviously, uh, this one would be affected. This is United. Wow, this is our opportunity, if I may say, to protect United High School. Yes. This is our opportunity as a committee, since we already see what's happened to the area around Muller, to prevent another scenario happening. Actually, here. actually, it wouldn't. It wouldn't really be that. It wouldn't be that much. It wouldn't be that much. Currently, uh, United and the current the buffers of 500 feet or not, there's no gas yeah. network. Yeah. So that that point. It, right it would have very minimal effect here. I could see. Um, maybe some areas in 359 being affected, and then let's look at West Laredo. <coughs> gallery to another um, to like uh, open map layers and it probably will read all faster if you'd like to. Yeah, we just got really really slow in here. So Dovalina is right here. Let's say it would come out to right here. No, that wouldn't really affect much there. Wilkinson is <coughs> Some, some, somewhere in here, I think. Left of the or somewhere in here. Yeah, yeah, left of the tracks, west of the track, out of the track. I guess that one right there, the the furthest south one on the screen, you can see the this one right there. Right there. Yeah. yeah. No, that's uh, <coughs> that's another warehouse. Oh. Like Wilkinson didn't have a hazmat permit. Okay. No. I, I mean. I, I, I think a thousand feet probably wouldn't be that unrealistic. Unrealistic. For the current school locations, correct? Could we do a separate one for future site school sightings? So that we could keep the Our attorney. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. I'm not sure. And like we talked about last time about then donating most of the school's land, right? So I understand that we could put restrictions, but how how much of a restriction we could put could probably limit the land that we can accept, right? So it might be a good idea to speak to the school district as well because, <coughs> excuse me, um, they need to understand that we're restricting any land that they may be able to receive in the future, right? Um, and, and that's also something that, I mean, I hope we have to look up cases to see who's anything I can email y'all um, but as far as restrictions for the future I think it, is a, it goes back to what I talked about last time mm -hmm. the taking. The taking. Yeah. I'm, I'm curious sure. on that point if someone were to file a lawsuit under those um, grounds would it invalidate the city ordinance as is so we'd revert back to what we have now which is nothing in terms of this radius or would they would it remain in place until a court ruled 
I think it remains in place until the ruling. Okay, so it wouldn't like undo all the work that we're trying to accomplish while the litigation is pending because that can take forever. Right. And, and usually our ordinances have something in it that basically says that if there's a part of this ordinance that is found to be invalid, uh, it doesn't affect the rest of the ordinance. The rest of the ordinance. Yeah. Right. Okay. So, I, you know, if the committee wants to recommend a thousand, I don't think that's uh, going to have too much of an effect. I think once you go beyond that, I think you're going to have more of an effect. And uh, I think, uh, you know, making a recommendation, getting it out there, getting it on the books, I, I would recommend doing that versus trying to get the, the perfect. You know, we can always amend, mm -hmm. and, and I, I bring up the example of the green space ordinance and the plastic bag ordinance, where you know there was so much input into that, and they were trying to get everything perfect. Um, that the green space took four years, and the plastic bag took what, Tricia, seven years, whatever, um, and and so I, I think sometimes it's good to strike wide while the iron's hot and and we can always amend it we can always expand it we can always but you know to 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 pursue the the perfect distance um, i don't think it's necessarily time well spent i think if the committee thinks a thousand feet is sufficient which i think it is i mean that's quite a buffer um, The committee should go with that. So, if I were to make a, rec a recommendation of a thousand feet, okay, for the for the schools right now that exist. No, in other words, it would be future. So, if somebody yeah. is building a school and then the school gets uh, mm -hmm. built, uh, obviously, if the school gets built first and warehouses come in afterwards, then we just wouldn't be able to issue permits. If uh, warehouses are there and they have permits and a school gets built then they've got a permit until they cease operations in which case then whoever moves in wouldn't be able to handle hazardous materials. So this is not too far discussion and possible action on recommended changes to the hazardous materials ordinance to implement distance requirements from schools mm -hmm. that's one as well as develop a recommendation on a distance requirement from industrial zones for future school signing. Now on, the, on that one you know that that's really more of I mean that that's all it is. It's a recommendation. Enforcing it with the school district is is a different story. You know, we certainly can say we don't think you should be, you know, come up with a number two miles away from an industrial zone. That just may not occur. But if we can certainly make put that in, you know, planning ordinance or hazmat ordinance or wherever we want to put it to just say. The city recommends against citing a school within so many two months. So many. I actually, I think two miles is a lot. I mean, it that's a lot. lot. When you start looking at the map, that's it a is huge a lot. Distance. Except I know Midwest yeah. sterilization is two miles from Mueller, and mm -hmm. so I look at that, and that's a pretty good perspective for me to use since that's on the next meeting. By the way, we'll talk about that. But. I, I'm just saying I know it is a lot, but I'm really referring to this beautiful area that we saw that's mm -hmm. agricultural and, and and United High School and places that we can mm -hmm. start to to look at a a nicer uh, buffer zone mm -hmm. for the sake of our children and, and you know for our community. That's my my thinking. I would recommend a thousand as we've just been discussing for what we've been tasked with for the distance requirement but for the future I really believe we we need to hold it to a higher standard and it doesn't mean this the city council will agree to this I understand but I'm gonna hold firm to my two miles on that do you want to put that in a motion yes I'd like to make a motion that we make the recommended change of uh, 1,000 feet uh, from hazardous materials as the distance requirement from schools and also uh, to add for a distance requirement for 
future sites to have a distance requirement of 2,000, uh, excuse me, two miles for um, the future of school siding. I don't think that was said real clear, but I think you got my gist. And just for clarification, no, no, go ahead, John, you were going to get to the point I was making. So is that two miles from a M1 or M2 or two miles from? Um, hazardous materials. Because the, the, the problem with that is we don't know. When we're in the platting property, we don't know what it's what going to be. So we do know what the zone's going to be. Okay, we can And so you could say two miles from, 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 an, from an M2, let's say. Okay. No, uh, no, no, not yet. They're in discussion. I'm cool with that. Okay. I from an M1 or M2, because. Clarify your motion. What is the committee? Like, like an M2 would be the place that you were talking about, uh, Midwestern. Mm -hmm. Whereas M1 could be a warehouse. and. Yeah, I guess M2 they're good. then. M2. Okay. Definitely. I'm sorry, who's that? The committee can discuss. You just need a second to continue discussion. Point of order. I, I just want to make a point. I think we should split your, your motion into, into two. two yeah, because oh, okay. no, we're piggybacking them. I think we may create some confusion. Uh, if I'm you'd like to urge your motion problem. in two parts, okay. then we can put it to a vote. Restating the motion, Council. Okay. 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 Oh, yeah. John, I had a question about the buffer zones. If we do decide to implement this, what does this mean for current schools? I don't think I got that part. So it would it wouldn't do anything for current schools mm -hmm. if the warehouse within that buffer zone already has a permit. So it would only be like you mentioned that if they need to reapply, then they. But if they if they go out of business and somebody new moves in there and. They wanted to acquire a permit, and we, we couldn't issue another permit. Mm -hmm. okay. Will the landowners be happy about that? I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying that I care, but like, <laughs> is it, is well, we'll, 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 we'll find out. <laughs> <laughs> when, they when they sue us, we'll know. Yeah. <laughs> well, you, you say that when someone goes out of business and a new business pops up, but what if I'm a business owner and I just sell a Russell and it's the same entity but it's changing ownership? There, there's probably requirements there as far as transferring the hazmat license. Yeah. Uh, so you probably just get, you can hand it over. Here's the business. Here's the license. I have to reapply. So it's still triggered at the. You know, if if you bought out Russell's business, uh, probably not. But if you if Russell left and then you rented that warehouse, and right? The permit, a whole new Yeah, because I'm just wondering like how they could get around it. And a side comment before we start, go ahead with the resolution, with the uh, recommendation. Perhaps it's wise to really uh, check more often than three times a year, if that's the amount, I'm not sure, on these hazmat licenses that are near schools. And I think that would be nice to prioritize too. So let's say there's four or five you mentioned around Muller. I would think those have to be, you know, really looked at carefully, regularly, because they're so close to schools. That's that's just a side comment. I'm not too much. And we do we, we try and do at least four times a year, four? but okay. but we also go after uh, warehouses that aren't in compliance. Um, and, you know, it's like anything else. I mean, you, you, you go and inspect somebody, and everything is is immaculate. Everything's always in place. They, you know, they know what they're doing. You know, that's four times. But you go in there, and they don't know where their stuff is stored, and they don't have their paperwork. And is it unannounced? Yes. Okay. okay. And then, as uh, at, with having a permit, then we have a right to inspect really at any time. I remember is there a motion for further yeah. discussion on, the, on a motion yet? No. No, the motion has not been restated. <coughs> I remember there was a big explosion um, in West. Can I add, or <laughs> can I add West. something? Or? Council, it doesn't seem like, like it was that long. Like it was eight yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. 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 And I remember uh, well, I just wanted to <laughs> there make was some sure, discussion um, about that there was no inspection. In this ordinance that we create, that it doesn't adversely affect um i guess growth or uh, take from landowners because we are going to have 
um, growth in the city, and so we do need to have safeguards in place, like Ms. Montero said. Um, you know, United High School, that, that land is undeveloped. Um, we don't want to have another, you know, Muller Elementary. Uh, a lot of places in the country don't have schools so close to warehouses and don't have warehouses so close to homes, and so that's something that we've done here in Laredo. Um, erroneously, arguably, over the last you know decades, and and we can see the residents in my own area kind of suffering the negative consequences of that kind of um, planning decisions, um, those kinds of decisions. But what we want to do uh, right now, I think the goal here is to make sure that um, when you have a school. Uh, that you don't have hazardous materials uh, within so within so many feet, but we don't also don't want to make it too far because then if we make it too far, then uh, it's gonna limit what people can do uh, for a long, long distance. Like uh, I mean, two miles is kind of long. A mile is kind of long. Uh, I don't know if the committee would agree with that or not. I, I think. I was thinking more like a couple blocks or a block or you know just kind of like where the trucks won't won't necessarily like where there's where there's not going to be danger when they you know with the parents picking up the children or with the parents or with the children playing outside um these cases like the ethylene oxide that we're talking about um that's that's a Midwest sterilization, I don't know if you all know, but if you go down um, Chilum Industrial uh, all the way towards 35, it's one of the last few streets, we, well, it's kind of midway, um, it's by the Medpac plant, and that company was brought here by, because of Midwest, because of that Midwest um, company, because Midwest used to sterilize their products in another city. I mean, they would transport it all the way to another state. And then that company decided to go ahead and capitalize on, on a location, at, um, I guess, like um, advantage to be next to it so that when Midwest creates their tools and everything, they just send them next door to get sterilized. But it's very far away from, you know, the school in terms of like you have to drive and it is kind of a, and there's a lot of things in between. I'm more concerned about the diesel and, and, and emissions and things like that that are actually closer to the school. And so um, that's kind of a separate issue here. But what we're talking about is, is hazardous materials and Anything can, a lot of things can be considered a hazardous material, uh, just even in the way that they're stored or the, the way that they're named, which is actually, you know. So I asked Mr. Porter, is there a way to classify different levels of hazardous and things like that? And so we don't want to get too complicated. Um, I think what we want to do, the main, main goal right now is protecting schools from having hazardous material, like, within a very tight radius of them, um, that, that if there's a spill, a spill or something, it's not gonna really affect the school um, the way it would if it was. But at the same time, even two miles, three miles, four miles, I mean, even in the case of Midwest, it's pretty far away and, and we're all, everybody in this area is possibly at risk because of the air quality, but um, let's, Let's not um, get into a situation where they're going to come back to the city and they're going to like try to sue us because you know th there's there's not a lot of land in Laredo and um, so I'd like for it to be where you know if the, there's a land uh, across the street from Muller Elementary I'd like for that land not to be used to store hazardous materials. I don't know who can give us a a, de a, a distance. But in the back of the school, there's a lot of warehousing and, and storage. So if, anybody there would be grandfathered. But like Ms. Obedo said, let's kind of protect these future schools. There's a school going up possibly on Aquero. There's, there's a school possibly going up by the Max Mandel. And, you know, these are all potential for, you know, hazardous materials to be stored around them. So we do need to establish, like, clear set limits. I mean, maybe 500 feet would be good. I don't know if that the 
many would agree with that, but I don't know how many a, a miles like what I'm, I'm forgetting my math here, but like eight to feet. I don't know. Five thousand two eight. Yes, right. <laughs> <laughs> He's in the yeah. dark to grammar school. I don't know. Five hundred feet would be a good distance. I don't know. A, a good compromise for now. It would take away the immediate problems of like Mulder. Uh, it could always be tweaked as we go forward, but um, you know there is possible construction coming up, so we do kind of want to hit a consensus as soon as possible. So that's my input. Thank so, you. So, Councilman Pettis, may I ask you? Can you hear me, yeah. Councilwoman yes. Pettis? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, would you support our recommendation of a distance requirement of 1,000 feet? from warehouses containing hazardous materials and schools? Are you saying that it's more than what you would recommend? Well, I would like to defer to Mr. Porter on that one because Mr. Porter's been here for a long time and, and he's dealt with a lot of issues and if he thinks that's good, I'd be fine with it. If he thinks it's too much or if he thinks it's gonna cause other issues where we're gonna get sued or we're gonna, you know, it'll be overkill then then i defer to what he suggests because i know that mr porter's a strong advocate for us in the community and so i think that if he suggests the thousand or if he thinks that's good i'm fine with it but if he thinks it's going to cause other problems because we have discussed like landowner it's 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 we get a lot of complaints like daily and a lot of issues brought to our attention daily and sometimes there's unintended consequences with good intentions and so um i, I defer that question to mr porter just because of his expertise i mean council member i, I think a thousand i think a thousand would be okay you, you may get some pushback in which case i guess council could always then reduce it. Is this a wiggle? That's true. And then we're going to go higher, I imagine, than what we propose. So yeah. Yeah. But I, I think the, okay, so whatever the committee comes up with, uh, I know everybody in this room cares about the community and, and the environment. I know Ms. Cortez is here, so um, I'm just here to listen and kind of, you know, see where you all are, are, are thinking with this, with this policy that we're trying to create. Um, I just want to make sure that whatever we decide, you know, we can kind of take it back to council sooner than later, um, and that you know, we're I, it's just we're going to start to get the phone calls from the property owners. So I, then, um, then if if I may, I, I think 500 is a very safe number. I think a thousand, you're getting into borderline. You're getting into you're going to get a yeah, it's very borderline. You're gonna, you're going to get calls on a thousand. 500, I don't think. Well, the developers are primarily talking about it, it's mainly in, in the uh, mines road area well, which developers are we talking about well at this point it would, it would just be property owners right yeah who want to build a warehouse or, or who want to who want to move into a warehouse and store hazardous materials or have an existing warehouse with hazardous materials because this wouldn't really prevent warehousing the warehousing can still go up it would just be limiting the, the the materials that they can have and and i think mr porter and i discussed how even like cleaning materials are considered hazardous so you couldn't even have a walgreens or you couldn't even have a convenience store because they store hazardous materials right mr porter would kind of restrict so, so on, on, on commercial uh you know for like goods that are being sold that they don't need that this is this is more bulk quantity but i i think i think for the concern about molar i think 500 would be would work and i think that would be a safe number but if you want to go with a thousand obviously that would add more you know more of the there's more of a safety factor but you're going to affect a lot more people what if we hit in the middle of 750? That's what I was going to say. That would work, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you want to do a proposed motion again? Yes, mm -hmm. I'll propose. I'd like to propose a recommendation of 750 feet to serve as a buffer 
zone between warehouses containing hazardous materials and schools. Do I hear a second? I think on 750 is a little Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I, think should, I think we should go with a thousand. And Thank you, Mr. Gonzalez. And uh, <laughs> leave ourselves some wiggle room. And push back. Yeah. Sure. Right. Right, Jerome. I don't do yeah, that. because I mean, you may be talking hazardous materials that don't really have a lot of potential for impact, but then you could be talking about like the situation with the fertilizer in, in the Waco. city of West, mm -hmm. oh, West. The, where there was an explosion eight years ago. It doesn't seem like it was that long ago, but it was a huge explosion. I remember there were some issues with whether they had proper inspections or whether they were storing correctly or whatever, but so big is a rather wonderful people. Do you think the 800 would make the difference by the 50? I, I think it's, it's <laughs> it goes a thousand mm -hmm. even number. That's just my opinion. Can you turn that into a I, I guess uh, so it dies if, if it dies for lack of a second, then yeah. yeah. So do you want to make a motion on that? Uh, yeah, I would, I would make a motion for 1,000. I second it. Okay. All in favor? <laughs> what a surprise! <laughs> 1,000 feet right. buffer, so. Well, that was my original. Right. We're going to cut them up. Mr. Gonzalez? Mr. Jones? Joanne? I just need clarification. If, it, if we do decide on the thousand, then it goes to council to decide. So right. they can yes. address. Yes. Yes. This so they can either just say, yeah. yes, we're just mm, talking heads. Okay. I can so are they not able to, I'm sorry, no, 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 no. are they, they, they not able it? to deviate okay. from mm -hmm. our recommendation at all? Yeah, this is the advisory committee. Yes. So they can they can take your advice, they can yeah. add to it, they can subtract from it. Right, they can modify it. Okay, so it's not like the yes or no to no. a thousand and that's it. Yeah, we don't have power. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> we don't need to I counted yes. six yes. votes in favor. Yeah. Let's do it again. And then we'll settle on something. Let's do it again. I guess, is, is there anybody that was opposed to it? Who's opposed? None opposed. Then the motion passes unanimously, I imagine it. Unless you're abstaining. <laughs> I'm just a little confused because if then they just deny it, are we, do we get the option to resubmit? No, so this was my like question that's... after you asked. If they, I understand that they have the ability to do just with that what they will. It's not a yes or no. It's not a black and white. Okay, okay. It's an advisory. Yeah, okay. so okay. they can they can do whatever they think is right. So you have to have a meeting and present like the map and show them what it, what will be affected and then they can decide. Okay. So you okay. can tell them what you all decided. We actually you don't board the meeting, but you can. Uh, yeah. yeah, you can. Uh, I guess well, John would be the one. Probably what we do is just a okay, okay. staff presentation. Well, and that works. Yeah. <laughs> you want to vote now? Yes. Okay. I'm in. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you scary. for the clarification. I appreciate the walk. Great. Joanne, do you have any, anything else you want to move on? Do we make another motion now for future school signings, John? Yeah. Is that appropriate at this you point, or do we want to continue the discussion? That was the second question. It, it's it's part, up no? to the committee. What do y'all want to do? The recommendation. You want to do it? No, you were going oh, to I do know, it. but I'm just saying if anybody had a comment. Okay, my second recommendation. Oh, excuse, excuse me. So that, that is two miles from Muller, oh. just as an example. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is huge. <laughs> they can't build anywhere near there then. That's all I'm saying. We should yeah. just look like they were thinking about building by the golf course. So, okay. Well, that's great. Right. It's five yeah. miles. Yeah. Okay. Okay. yeah, it's more than five from the level. But then that get on school. <laughs> However, I thought they might be building by Benitas. I don't know if that's true. Will the future recommendation affect schools that are already uh, planned? Right. I, I think this is just purely a recommendation. I don't think the city can actually hold the school district to this, quite frankly. Yeah, exactly. Right. 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 
we can control the permits of the schools. Yeah, uh, it would, it would it purely be. Yeah. It has to be for the permits. Well, Joy? then I'd like to propose a recommendation of a one mile buffer zone. Keeping in mind what Councilwoman Betta said, a one mile buffer zone for future school sites between warehouses containing hazardous materials and the school site. One mile buffer zone. I second. Mr. Gonzalez seconds. All those in favor? Aye. Mr. Gonzalez, <laughs> your name, Madam Clerk. Bianca, Miss Gonzalez. Gonzalez, and Joanne, in favor. All those, all those opposed? To Mr. Jones, be opposed. It's just a suggestion. Motion carries. When there's a when there's a chemical a chemical spill anywhere, I, I was in the emergency response for the TCK. I do. I call him Mr. Jones. Let's say, for example, you do the mark, right? If 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 there's something that happened within the warehouses, they have to uh, depending on the chemical and whatnot. There, there, there's a. Um, Kind of like suggested distances for the for the command center to operate, right? Mm -hmm. So it's usually like a they're pretty much set is like a mile radius. Mm -hmm. So the mile would cover. I don't think any mm -hmm. more than a mile. Is. Okay. I just want to, as an after thought to that, when this chemical spill happened on Kellum years ago, I remember speaking to somebody from the city and he said that the warehouse owner was a Mexican citizen who refused to pay for the cleanup so it, it became a burden of the city of Laredo and I do believe we have some situations like that so that's neither here nor there but that was a mile from home so that's why I bring that additional information but we also are tasked with so much because of the owners some of the owners don't believe in the and, and and some of that some of that is the city's fault back then. I, I saw the bill for that. You did. And um, like fire fire department, like forty pizzas and uh, McDonald's. I mean, it was it was. I understand for the cleanup, but it, it was. They were they were billing for everything, and so if I would have gotten that bill, I would say I'm not going to pay it either. How, how many bottles are cheap? That's ridiculous. It it was it was like forty thousand dollars or something, and and um, that was just clean up, and and I I, I I agreed with that because you know it'd be like if if you had to call the fire department and they came out to put out a fire at your house that was due to an electrical short or something like that. And then you get a bill for twenty thousand dollars out there. Yeah. Well, well, well why, why are we paying for the service then? Yeah. So I, I I I I know that the fire department has brought those numbers down and made it more um, you know more fair. But yeah, I, I remember seeing that at the time, and I thought I, I wouldn't have paid for this either. <laughs> but also, I think you have to respond immediately if it's a chemical spill. And oh, yeah, absolutely. And it yeah. falls. Yeah most likely to us but but you know that that's why we have a hazmat uh, trained fire department to respond to those and, and yeah to, to build yeah. everybody after the fact <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah I remember that that's funny though okay any more discussion on item number five I'm done we're done great okay <laughs> 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 item number six uh, discussion and possible action on developing and recommending the same for your escaping. I know that there was heavy in the last meeting. And uh, I think Mr. Rogers is here to speak yes, with us on that. Yes, Mike Rogers. You're you speaking with us, actually, right? Pardon me? You presented here before. Yes, yeah, well, um, yeah, on the on the web. I talked about it last night. Right, right. right. Um, and, and today I brought you two handouts. Um, last time we talked a little bit about water age and that we're, we're flushing more in certain areas. And so if we're gonna talk about zero scaping, I wouldn't want to replace revenue water with non-revenue water. So um, what I thought I'd do is give you an idea here of how much water we use and who's using it. 
So the, the first section of this is just just the total amount of water being used. Okay, and then it, and it's by irrigation, residential is seven percent, seven point four percent. Domestic use, residential is fifty five. And um, and so uh, commercial domestic is you know used for the restrooms and all the domestic use is twenty four. So we're talking about commercial irrigation and trying to get that reduced. You're talking about trying to reduce what's twelve point eight percent of the water. Y'all haven't figured this out, and I love numbers. I love math. I like statistics. We're going to study this because you can't manage things that you don't measure. And these are the measurements that's going to help us make good decisions. So then I went and looked, and it's not easy to go do this. You think our computers just spit this stuff out? We have to run. We have to run programs to look at this stuff. So I ran a, and I grouped our biggest users into these seven, these nine categories. Uh, I'm going to start with the bottom two. Wow. We're going to leave the orphanage out, <laughs> okay? Um, and the number eight industrial use and we've used the term industrial and i went and you know depending on what dictionary but we're using the tcq definition of industrial use and that means it's being used inside the plant like if i make i make concrete i need water right so we give them an irrigation meter because we're not charging them sewer that's the point of a different type style meter i don't charge it it's not coming back to me to treat everything through your house comes back to me and i charge you for it so that's why, so also road use. So number eight and nine are really not. Well, if you'll look, the top four are the schools, the city parks and recs, hospital churches, apartments, and condos. I have not graphed these, but just kind of intuitively you'll say, well, all those kind of things are in the places that we live. Schools, houses, churches, banks, community centers, right? So all those areas, I have good water use. I typically don't have old water. I usually don't flush next to apartments. They're using a lot of water. Or, or in your houses. I'm flushing in other areas, okay? And I want to separate that. I'm just going to leave the schools out. You got Tanyu and you got LCC, and they're not really in. They kind of move those further out to the ends. So we, the focus was our warehouse districts, commercial and warehouse districts, and that's I call that Group Seven. And I've given you a map of those, and this is the top 150 customers, which is actually consuming nearly 59, almost 60 percent of the irrigation water. These top. 150. That's 150 out of 1,200. So these are the biggest guys that are using it, and the warehouse districts, the warehouse commercial, they're all in one little area. A couple of the ones over here and out at uh, mile 13. Again, warehouses don't use a lot of water. Most of their water is probably irrigation, and and. But yet, they have drinking fountains in those in those warehouses. They have a restroom. They have things. They use water. So I want their water to be fresh. Again, I, I'm going to give this to our engineers who study in our whole master plan. But the warehouses, if I restrict their water and make them go to zero scaping, I'm probably going to add flushers in that area. So I'm going to trade. I'm getting money. To have you, you you use the irrigation, and I'm going to stop getting that money and turn it into just flushing water in the streets. So I said it's kind of complicated. If you start looking, you have to study these things. Now, it does tell me that the groups one, two, three, and four, those are the people that won't hurt my water age. If I want to target someone that doesn't affect water quality. Just in general, it would be the first four groups. So I'm, I'm going to ask that y'all let us study this a little bit more. Let our consultants come back and tell us, because part of their, what they're doing includes what are other cities doing. Do you have uh, other cities that are having ways that they incentivize zero scale? 
and I, you know, it's a new, new topic for me, so I will study it a little bit more for you because it's complicated. It's really quick to make a, a ruling and have someone do something, then next thing you know, it, it, it hurts us. Um, and I have, I guess, some questions. To me, conservation and zero scaping, are we doing it because water is scarce? Or are we doing it because water is damaging our streams? Or are we doing it for both? Because the incentives would be different for each one of those. If I were to incentivize people for wasting water because it's scarce, then my recommendation would be to create irrigation rates, tiers of water, right? They're not, they're not, they're, 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 I'd make them separate. They're not separate right now. I would make them separate. And now if we're saying that we need to incentivize them, I would uh, tie those rates to the stage of drought that we're in when it really becomes scarce. You know, why reduce revenues if we have a lot of water? And, but when the state starts saying drought, drought stage one, drought stage two, and that's happened before, and we have to do, and we talked about, I, I mentioned, I used the term, um, the honor system, right? Our, our conservation plan is on the honor system. Every city kind of does that, you know? Depending on your house number, you're at stage one. We only want you to water on the, you know, Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays, and stuff like that. Well, if it's really a, se a separate stage, I cannot just do the honor system. I'll increase your rates 10%. So now it's both the honor, and if you do it, it's going to cost you more. I, you know, if you want less of something, tax it. Right. So I, I think we have to kind of think about, well, what's the purpose, and when do we want to do it? So it's just not just carte blanche, make a, make a ruling. So if you give me a little more time, I can help, you know, with our consultant. Let's come up with something that we think makes sense for the right areas, the right people, and at the right time. And damage for damage, uh, water damage. We get a lot of complaints about people over sprinkling. And, really? uh, huh? Yes, sir. Complaints? Complaints. From neighbors? Neighbors, yeah, they, they do. Okay, so here's the deal. We're never there when they're watering. <laughs> they're watering it. It looks dry to us. And the neighbors say, no, we never do that. That's, it's already dried up. You almost can't have enough water police to watch the water going into the street at that time. But the neighbors calling us every day. They're doing it, oh, and it's not every day. I mean, we're, not, we're not, you know, set up to do that. But I think damage is something. And the other thing is, that if I were to let let the dogs loose, they don't have any teeth. <laughs> I can't do anything. I run my five dollar citation. So if you want to control damage, you need to raise the stakes. And I'm going to have to really, you know, take cameras. I mean, I, I would want that if I was, if someone was blaming me. I'd be going, no, I've already paid my irrigator. Of course, if I buy my irrigator guy and he comes out, the plumber, I never watched him test it. He just told me he did a good job. So you really would have to video, I think. You'd have to have proof that's going to hold up in court because you're wanting to get, you're wanting to influence people to change their habits. It's complicated. Yeah. So. There. If you just kind of give me a little more time, I think I can help come up with some ideas. And I want to use our consultant that's doing the master plan to agree with these numbers and agree with these ideas. I have a question, of course, um, but I, it's directed to you, John. When the city council proposed this item for us to review, was there a concern or what prompted this? I, I think it's, you know, they wanted to do, see more zero scaping, but, you know, it, it, it was, I mean, as we've all learned here, it's way more complicated than we thought it would be. And, it, and of course it sounds good, right? Um, why don't these warehouses have zero scape? You know, it's not, they're not in areas that people typically spend their free time, and so, it just kind of made sense, but yeah, as we we learned, uh, why would utilities lose revenue and waste water so that we can have zero scaping? It doesn't make sense. Um, and, and actually, Mike and I were talking before this, and 
um, yeah, I think that the, the, the water master plan will kind of help us nail down what we want to do. But when they say incentives, it, it seemed like they were talking about where the city would give up something. But I think Mike makes a good point that an incentive can also be where the customer is penalized. And we were just talking, we used some, some local people here, which I'm not going to use, but a good example is uh, in Austin, they would publish the, the largest water users. And, you know, before uh, Lance Armstrong was found to be doping and was very wealthy and in the news a lot, he was the number one water user in, in Austin. And it doesn't make sense to take somebody who has that wealth and say, "Hey, we're gonna we're gonna give you a lower rate if you use less water." Now, actually, you want to make your money off of that guy. You want to reduce the charges for people that can't afford it. And so, I, I think the committee needs to think about these things um, as, as you know overall, so that we don't make that mistake of you know cutting water rates for Lance Armstrong. Yeah. Um, to say that we've got a, a zero escape ordinance. Right. It's yeah. not quite the same as our toilet rebate program. Yeah. Right. You know, I'm going to give you a hundred dollars if you'll get a new toilet because you're going to a low flush toilet. And like I said, you flush it three times. But we, I'm not going to go give money to the some of the biggest wealthiest users to go zero escape. I honestly have the money, and I think I drive by a couple of beautiful warehouse areas, and they're plush, a lot of grass. But it happens to be in an area where I kind of leave the water going. Yeah. You know, in the utilities, uh, growth is good and bad. I'll give you a good example. If y'all remember Highway 359, we had a bull water notice out there for a long time. When that line was decided to be put out to, uh, what's the furthest area? Um, Almost to Pueblo Nuevo. Pueblo Nuevo, yes. Yeah. Uh, probably would have done an 8 inch line. We put a 16. Is that right? The 16s? 16. We put a 16-inch line. That's four times as big as an eight. That's not eight. That's not twice, right? Because it's the area. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That works. Four times too big. Well, that's water age. Well, we we're going to be planning for you know for the future. We're going to have growth, and we'll need it. But if you don't, you shut yourself in the foot. It's a double-edged sword. Do you want to be prepared for growth in businesses? On the same, I'm going to make the water old. Well, so I'm just you not kind of, sure this is such a good use of your time since it really isn't a pressing issue as far as from, you know, you gave an excellent explanation to us. And really, thank you for that. And I just feel like this is putting so much on you, and I'm not sure it's a pressing issue after all. And, and, and that certainly can be what the, the committee recommends to council, that we don't think that this, based on the fact that this is very complex, uh, or if you want to, uh, as, as more information comes out, I think, like what Mike was saying, with having a, when water is scarce, have water prices increase so that we assure that there's enough water for everybody here. I, I think that makes sense. And there's nothing to enforce. The bill goes up, they pay a higher higher amount, yeah. and there's no. And there's nothing to enforce. If I try to enforce it, you're right. I'm going to have to hire more. You know, it's a nightmare for you. Yes. Enforcement is just yes. really impossible. Right. So I'm I'm in favor of. Uh, you want less of it? Tax it. And you and in any way that you want to, you know, assign those monies is fine. We order with you know up the council, but. There's someone, yeah, I, I don't mind studying this. This is good. This was good. This was good. And I think it's, our engineer hasn't started looking at it yet, but I'm going to pass him all this data and say, you need to include this so that his, his water plan is holistic about all of our water use. But I think you're right with Council John said, we just looked, you're going to be targeting 12.8% of our water. And then you got seven groups that use 60% of that number. But it's really, a few people and do you really want to go after our parks well that's where we all spend our time and we want the grass green uh, they may do better but so it's not, it's not easy and i had a question mike you were mentioning about these bigger groups like the banks the hotels the retails and i'd like to see them you know tracking that through maybe water becomes scarce and becomes 
Well, yeah, I mean, you know, you know, can't target certain groups. I mean, I'd be, you, well, you'd have to, you have to do it all commercial. I couldn't just say banks or hotels, but yeah, you could do There's no way to kind of maybe create something. That's a legal question, but I wouldn't think so. <laughs> yeah, well, something that maybe not, that sounds a little strict, but what I'm trying to get at is that, of course, we wouldn't try to go for the parks and the hospitals and, you know, those kind of places, but places, to your point, that have the ability to pay for these. Should, because I think I don't know all the logistics and maybe you can help me out but I think water is scarce everywhere no and it should be a big concern that we all have for well we have the same amount that we've always had it's just going into the ocean more. Mm -hmm. so uh, it's kind of scarce at some times when it's scarce it's really scarce mm -hmm. and you see the water tables go down right. but then there's other times when we're splashing in it so it's it's a it's a, a seasonal or a 10 year cycle type thing and and maybe getting worse and worse along along that whole path but uh when you, you said hospitals remember this is their irrigation this is their landscaping it's not the patient care this is all so even though you think i would let the hospitals out well why they you know maybe they can zero skip too okay. so i still think let's let the consultant because they have a, a portion of their their uh report to us that's going to review rates what other cities are doing and so i'm going to try to make them earn their money and and flush out a few more things for us so i would say we push this off until the master plan uh, engineer consultant comes up with something is everyone in agreement that we table this issue and allow mr rogers to come back yes great um really appreciate it sir thank you um item number seven items for next meeting does anyone have anything to add here no. Um, then I guess uh, I if I may, Mr. Yes. did the committee want to go over the uh, mid Midwest? Yes. Oh, thank you. Yes, I was just looking at them on this list of top irrigators, by the way. Um, yes, I'd like to add to next month's agenda that we look at the air pollution concerns that, uh, according to a report. Uh, that was made from, I believe, the University of Michigan regarding the dangers of ethylene oxide emissions in our community, especially in District 7. Mm -hmm. And I would, I would ask that you have Tricia also mm -hmm. maybe uh, yeah. give us a better explanation. Ethylene oxide. It's a waterless, uh, colorless gas. Wood. Acetylene. Oh, am I saying it wrong? No, you're, you're correct. Oh. We were talking about well using it. Oh, okay, I see. Thank you, John, for that reminder. It's used in antifreeze for one of the, on that, that thing I emailed you earlier, it has on, on I think on USD's memo to the fan, mm -hmm. to the parents and all, it has the different uses in there, or it's in that other link that I sent you. So. Oh, okay. It's like three different items. Yeah. So then I guess Trisha will be coming back at our next meeting here. Further discuss this issue. Yeah, yeah, so I'm, I'm trying to gonna try and get TCEQ as well since they um, would it regulate. be wise to maybe include someone from our local health department or I don't know. I'm just asking. I, I, I can. I don't know. I guess if they well they, they would be able to answer questions in terms of cancer rates. I I, I would like that. I would appreciate someone from the health department. Uh, any further business for next meeting? Well, with that, then uh, I guess I'll move to adjourn. Second. Second. Right. Thank you, everybody. Good work, John. You cooked a good one.